Okay, Dave, so in the last episode, we began to dive into a topic that I heard you just say this statement on a recent podcast episode around the place of generosity being so tied into a mindset of multiplication. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hold up, we got to unpack that. So you started to in our last episode, we're going to keep talking about it because it's so uh, critical. Dave has used this language a lot around a contributor mindset. Right. And I think it that language itself is, is a placeholder for a really big idea that requires a lot of repentance for us as Westerners who have got so individualistic. We've got to get back into a, a contributor mindset, into a, a communal mindset that also is another factor in that uh, heart and mindset of generosity. So take us back into that subject as yeah. we talk on this subject of I generosity. Mean, like we were just discussing, we can dive pretty deep. I mean, we can go all the way back to Genesis one Genesis 12 with the story yeah. of Abraham of Adam and Eve and really root this at a lot of places. But I think the two things that you mentioned and Sakai, you're teeing up the discussion. One is community. The other is contributing. Yeah. I can't contribute unless I'm part of a community. And so that the big, the barrier that you and I just butt our heads into all the time personally and with those that we're working with. Yeah. And also even leaders that we're working with will speak to us about the barrier. And that is very simple. Um, commitment, competition, individualism, put those all in a nutshell, that, that mindset is probably one of the biggest barriers mm -hmm. to movement and to um, multiplication and in a Western a, context. There's a definite big part of, uh, so the network we're part of, No Place Left, there's a big part of our vision cast that has to shift there because even we were talking about titling this podcast, which we've mentioned here recently, the head, the heart, the hands of the multiplying, right? Uh, the multiplier, but shifting that to the head, the heart, the hands of the multiplying church. Mm -hmm. A lot of what's celebrated in the network we're part of, and I think in the church at large, is the is the Hudson Taylors. It's the guy. It's the John Wesley's. It's the guy. The guy. The girl that is the person, right? Um, and when it's when that's your only way of thinking about it, and that they're they're important to the story, but if that's the only way of thinking about it you become uh, almost self-focused and selfish and there's no contributor mindset and a value for the multiplying church as a whole. I, I will go to just one story that comes to mind that I think really kind of sets the precedent for what a generous contributor mindset looks like as a leader. Yeah. So let's say you are in one of those categories. I think a perfect example of that, without question, Peter is one of the leaders of the new Testament, I right. mean, through the gospels in the beginning of acts. I mean, he's a central figure yeah. in the first half of acts and what what's going on in terms of what the Holy spirit's doing. But that one moment, right. Where we see the scattering of the church and there's the spreading out of the gospel. And he is called by the Holy spirit in a vision yes. to go to Joppa. Um, and he struggles with that idea because God lowers down the sheet and he's yeah. like, here, eat. And he's like, Lord, I'd never eaten anything unclean. And, and Jesus says to him, if I make it holy, you can eat it. Yeah. Right. Dave paraphrased there. It's not unclean if I've created it. And there's this racial barrier that's happening where the gospel's trying to make it over that Gentile hump. But to this strong Jewish kid, who's now an adult who followed after Jesus, who's focused so much on the people of Israel, even through yeah. Jesus's ministry, he's having to make a big jump, right? And so when he goes to Joppa and he sees that they receive the Holy Spirit, he celebrates and comes back. And one of the things we see in that moment, and we also see in the Antioch moment when the uh, Romans 15 fight happens, that whole fight is a racial fight. Yeah. It's we're Jews and we have this law, and they're Gentiles, so they don't have the law. Should they have to convert to our culture before they can convert to Christ? I mean, that's yeah. the central issue. Hubbing on circumcision and rituals and things like that. Who's the one who finally stands up and says, the Lord did this, the Lord did this, the Lord did this. It's Peter. Right. And then James comes in at the end and says, we've seen what God has done. Yeah. My point in saying all that is Peter was the guy. But what he does is he celebrates the contributions mm -hmm. of all of the unnamed people mm -hmm. who are starting churches in Cyprus, who are starting churches in Antioch, who are receiving the Holy Spirit in Joppa, right? And Paul, who's being called and he's being sent off to, to the Gentiles himself, yeah. 
all of that's to simply say, as leaders, they helped the movement get over the hump mm -hmm. by recognizing what the unnamed people did, celebrating that, and then doing whatever they could to facilitate the growth in that. That's a generosity mindset. They didn't mm -hmm. hold it. Yeah. Right. We were with Jesus. I was the disciple. No, no, no. They're turning around and saying, we want to open this up mm -hmm. to you. And so, so much of what Dave is highlighting here is something that you champion so well and have since I've known you, which is the father's heart, Genesis to Revelation, that he wants to use all people to reach all places. And you're referencing back to that Genesis 12 moment right. that Abraham is saying, God says, you're blessed to be a blessing. Right. And then that gets off track. The it, nation of Israel, they begin to begin really self-focused. It's about what, what it means for them. And even when Jesus is discipling his disciples, they were really focused on them and, yeah, that, so. and how they can get a, a good, they're, they're jockeying for position in this new kingdom. And uh, Peter here has gone through this repentance process and he's now talking about others and things are back on track for blessed to be a blessing. Yeah. And I think one of the ways in which repentance will come to us the quickest is when our strategy or our focus or our self-centeredness gets blown up by the Holy Spirit's work in something mm, that we thought good. we were working really hard. And this is, I would say, the moment when we're going to recognize the idol of that of mm -hmm. that competition in our heart, yeah. which all of us have, by the yes. way. I have yes. it. I have it. <laughs> you can say I have I'm it. I'm not going to assume that you have it, but you I'm saying say I have it. I have it. Yeah. I will tell you, the moment you know you have it is when you see God work in an incredible way in a coworker or someone that you know, yeah. that moment, we've talked about this before, maybe you, you're, you're scrolling through Facebook or you're on yeah. the No Place Left Facebook page and you see God do some work and your response to that, the first response to that is not praise God, he's moving in his kingdom. Your first response to that is, he's probably doing something else yeah. or why did it happen to me or whatever that may be. But why that, didn't I know about that? Right, already? why yeah. didn't I know about that? <laughs> oh, I could have done that if God would have used me. All of those, those thoughts that just start filtering in. All of those things are that idol in our heart that says, yeah. I'm really in a competition mode instead of contribution mode. Um, let's go back to Jesus's ministry and a particular moment, especially in the book of John. Um, yesterday, I was doing work all day long. I had to start at five in the morning and I was just doing stuff. I had uh, my AirPods in. Yep. And so I just listened to the entire book of John yesterday morning. And one of the moments about it that struck me was when Jesus does the miracle of a man with the withered hand, um, and, and they get mad at him. And Jesus says to him, you, you circumcise a child on the yeah. eighth day on the Sabbath. Yeah. How much better would it be for me to, you know, to, to heal the whole man? If we're talking about just a ritualistic symbol here, yes. the whole man's being healed. What's the problem? And then a little later on, John tells the story of the guy who gets the mud put on his eyes. And that just sends the Pharisees over the top, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're like, he made mud. That's work. If he was truly from God, he wouldn't be doing work. Yeah. Jesus is recognizing they don't get it. And the whole discussion ends up being Jesus saying, I'm, I am. Yeah. Before Abraham was born, I am. And they say, you're not yet 40 years old. And you say that you... You knew Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus comes back and says, I am. The whole thing is they're saying, you're demon possessed. You're insane. You can't be from God. And then the interesting part of that whole discussion that point that just really sticks out to me is they say, um, he says, you are of your, of your, you're of your father, the devil. And they're like, we're not illegitimate. We're children of Abraham. Wow. That is a self-centered. Wow. Instead of being blessed to be a blessing. They have completely, utterly transitioned to, I'm a child of Abraham, therefore I deserve everything. Wow. And they completely lost the conduit of what God wanted to do. And Jesus is, is saying, look, look, I'm blessed by the Father. And I'm turning around and I'm healing people, yeah. right? And you're fighting it. And so somewhat, hopefully not to derail where you're going here, but um, I think it's interesting that... Um, he, they they got to repent because where they're going is not um, a kingdom mindset. No, but it's also understandable that they are trying to be a peculiar set apart nation right. in exile, right? At, at, and trying to stay distinct. And so they're trying to hold on to. They've lost. They've lost the plot. They've lost the vision of blessed to be a blessing because they're so focused on trying to preserve what they have. Right. How much do we do that all the time? As I mean, oh, we've got this whole theme right now in North America where we're, we're going to fight for our, our little piece of the pie as Christians and our role in the culture and all this stuff. 
uh, we've lost the plot of blessed to be a blessing and what that actually means to be a peculiar people and catalytic. And can you speak to how does that then translate to? Well, it, 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 it has created an environment where competition is the norm. And I would say whenever you, you can definitely tell when somebody loses the plot, when infighting begins over who's right and who's wrong. Now, yes. that's not to say doctrine is very important to you and I. Theology is very important to you and yes. I. We come from different theo theological traditions. Yes. Um, and there are certain things that you and I disagree on. But what brings us to the point of saying we've got to come together is we have enjoyed a majority position in our culture for so long mm -hmm. that we think we can dominate and just tell people to do things by power. Yeah. And so we behave as a majority. We're the authority. We speak it. You say it. You should do it. Yeah. Now, I do recognize that Jesus has ultimate authority over all things, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm -hmm. But the irony is, is that the most authoritative person who ever lived, Jesus, didn't just say he had authority. He actually had it, Yeah. and he did not behave that way. Yeah. Right? He came humble. He became obedient as a slave even to the point of death on the cross, right? Yeah. Philippians chapter two. He had so much authority, he didn't need to right. prove it. So that's the irony. He had so much authority that his trust was in the father's sovereign plan, and he was obedient to what the father had him to do. So how do we go from competition to contribution? Um, you know, Rooting for Rivals is a book where I've got this language from. Yeah. Highly recommend it. If you've not read Rooting for yes. Rivals, you should do it. It's a couple of guys that are writing because they're from nonprofit organizations. And they were like talking about how um, one was going after lung cancer, one was going after heart disease, and they were wrestling over each other's uh, donors. And they thought, well, if somebody dies, somebody dies. It doesn't matter if it's a heart or a lung. Aren't we after seeing a whole person healed regardless yes. of what the problem is. And then all of a sudden they got the larger picture. And instead of competing, they started to contribute to each other and helping each other out. Wow. That is what we're missing and what you're pointing yeah. out is why did God make Israel a peculiar people? Ultimately to, to be what? To be a blessing to the nations. Right. To be a kingdom of priests. There's a whole bunch of different metaphors that are used throughout the scripture, but God was wanting to call people to himself to set them apart so that they could show the rest of the world what they could join. Right. Yeah. But we, we close it off whenever we lose two things. I think one is that God is sovereign and can be trusted. Mm -hmm. And we move from fear of God into fear of man. Yeah. That one will do it because then we, then we clench up when we get yeah. afraid. Think about our culture right now in the United States and COVID. What, what causes everybody to just freak out panic mode is fear and fear is what's used to just keep driving control. So if we lose the fear of God and we turn to fear of man, we're going to turn inward and get competitive. That's true. The second thing is, is that God is not only sovereign, but God is all powerful and can resource whatever it is he wants wow. to do. He's provider. Which, by the way, in the story of Abraham, is the two things that God taught Abraham. Wow. Right? Fear me. And second of all, I will provide. God, provider God, comes from the story of Abraham. Mm. Right? Whenever he's in the thicket or he's about to kill um, his son. Yeah. Isaac. Thank you. COVID fog moment. He's about to kill Isaac. And then God provides the lamb in the thicket. And then in that moment, Abraham says, God provides. And what Abraham learns in that moment is, I cannot be blessed to be a blessing unless I understand that the blessings are not intended for me and that they're unlimited. Wow. But if I don't fear him, whenever I take the blessings, I am afraid of other things. Yeah. I close in, I hang on, I start to inwardly focus, and I lose my generosity because I'm afraid that I will lose those things. And I'm afraid that if I don't yeah. keep them, I won't get more. Yeah. But if I believe God's in ultimate control, does it make sense? It does. I receive, I give, knowing that he will give more, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to fear him and use it in a way that he desires for me to use it for his kingdom. Amen. That's really good. You know, something that we've talked about, uh, it's a theme that's come up at different points in our just honest conversations and repentance is that God doesn't promise us a movement, right? That's not a given thing. Right. We see that happen in the pages of scripture. And we see that happen in different moments throughout history. God doesn't promise that, but we do know that he is unchanging. Mm -hmm. And we do know that a movement is going to the, like 
bet it happens is at least going to correspond or correlate to a people that have got those realities set in their heart. Right. That God is all powerful, that he can right. do this. Right. And the community has to understand that. Right. Because we'll see and we can mention names of leaders of movements that have become pretty synonymous with God doing some pretty incredible things. Right. We can name a few of those. But let's say a leader comes and he says, you know, we, we've breached the 125,000 church mark. Mm -hmm. OK, that's an incredible movement. But to pit that on one man, how many people are involved with a church planting movement of 125,000 people? How many leaders are involved? You know what I'm saying? And God yeah. knows the name of every single one of them. And not only involved now, I've just, part of my repentance process lately has been to just one of the passages God's speaking to me out of is John 4. Jesus has this interaction with the woman at the well, which is usually our focus on the beginning of John 4, that, that story. But at the end of it, his disciples come back, and this is his teaching moment with them. Mm -hmm. He says, look, are not the fields oh, yeah. white for harvest? Others have sown, and you are reaping where they've sown. So in other words, Yes, there's a lot of people contributing right now, even to bringing in the harvest. Look, do you see it's time? But others have sown implies that there's others that have, are part of this work that Absolutely. you don't even know their name. Right. And we could even go back to, I mean, who knows how far back you could trace what God is doing, even in, let's say, uh, South Asia. But the 1040 window concept yes. started to really gain steam in the 70s yeah. after the Louisiana movement started to really say this is the, the hotbed of what's left. Uh -huh. Um, and then as we move into the 80s, it starts to kind of work its way out into mission organizations mm -hmm. and focuses and resources start to turn. And then as you get into the late 80s and the 90s, as I was a kid growing up in church, even in my small little Indianola First Baptist Church of 35 people, yeah. we were praying for the 1040 window through the 90s. Right. And then even as a youth pastor years early in the 2000s, we're talking about the 1040 window, 1040 window. And then lo and behold, uh, here we are in 2021, and over the last 15 years, movements have began to pop up, and, and, and we started seeing in 2005, 2006, those first pieces of what has now been yeah. called church planning movements. All that's to simply say two decades of prayer yeah. before the first movement even came into being, right? How many people have been praying for that, and how long, how many contributions Amen. had to be given for that? This is such an invitation to this repentance process. And I feel like it's like we're watching this progressive repentance happen in the movement world right. uh, towards the priesthood of the believer. And I think we've like thought, oh, we've we've got this uh, all the way back to the book of Exodus. Moses gets the word of the Lord. I want to make you a kingdom of priests. Book of Revelation. That's the ultimate goal. Right. And we think, oh, we're giving the, the ministry back to the people. But we still vision cast the guy the girl the person and we pin mm -hmm. it all on them mm -hmm. and we attach the story to them that's still we're still not getting it there's this process that we've got to go through and we're watching happen only reason why movements happen is because a lot of people are doing the right stuff and contributing to the work and and getting to a place to where uh, even a conversation that i've had over the last week with one of our 20 somethings here in oklahoma city um watching them go through this repentance process and watching the Lord put them in situations to where they're saying things like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm going to quit. Yeah. And you know, when they call and they vomit on me, yeah. Right. In, in anxiety, um, it's a good thing. It's on a phone conversation because I don't want them to see me smile. But the truth of the matter is, is that whenever I see them wrestling so hard with, I'm not getting anywhere, I'm doing everything. And, and the whole conversation is I, 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 and then you come back and you say, you know, I was a, a really po significant portion of everything we just talked about. You need to trust him. Mm -hmm. And then for them to go, I know, I know. I, I have to smile, Mark, because yeah. it's, we're watching the Lord just rip out competition and yes. start inserting contribution and generosity. Sure. And I think, you know, I use the term synergy um, to describe this concept. Yes. What does it look like for the entire church to give their contribution? Yeah. And it includes, you know, a lot of times we're thinking specific like mission stuff, like share the gospel or plant a church or pastor a church or do the apostolic work or do a training or do it, but it's business, right? It's, am I reaching out to my neighbors? Yeah. Am I reaching out to my coworkers? Am I 
taking advantage of the resources that God is putting in my life and leveraging them in every respect um, for the kingdom, every person, yeah. right? And, and synergy can't really be defined because it's God taking his people and saying, I want you to give what I've given you. I want you to bless others with the blessings that I've given you yeah. towards a no place left great commission completion vision. Man, that's so good. And see if this resonates for you. I, I, what's coming to my mind, and I, we're doing this off the cuff, so I'm just uh, sharing what's coming to my mind, but somewhere in the middle of 1 Corinthians, Paul uh, begins to kind of unfold his ministry and the way that he has postured himself in responding to the tribalism of the beginning of the book, which right. we've talked about on right. the podcast. But he begins to say, I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Right. And if what comes to my heart is like, that's the outcome of a contribution mindset mm -hmm. that in this situation with this person on the street that I'm sharing the gospel with, or this church that I'm invited to go share with, or this network that I'm going to, I become what I need to become so that I can contribute what's relevant for that moment to that person, to that group. How do they see me? How do, what do they need me to be? What is God doing in that right. situation? And I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of what comes up repetitively in my heart and in the hearts of other people that I'm working with, especially in America. Um, I think one of the hardest things to be generous with mm -hmm. is our version of our hopes and dreams. Mm. Wow. What, right. I'm, we're raised our entire lives to be like, you can be whatever you want to be in the United States of America. Um, and the crazy thing is that's true. Mm -hmm. It's not guaranteed, but you put your hands to the plow, you work really hard, you catch a couple of breaks, you meet the right people, um, and you put some sweat into it. And you can do quite a bit here that people from other places in the world would never have an opportunity to do. Yeah. It's a reality, yeah. not a guarantee, but a reality. Yeah. But with that comes the fact that we start to think that we control our destiny, mm -hmm. like that somehow... I get to pick who I'm going to be and what I'm going to do. And I just go and work for that. And yeah. I'm saying, if we have that mindset, mm -hmm. we're not in the kingdom, mm -hmm. right? Because now we're saying, God, here's everything I'm going to do for you. Bless it. And one of these days I'll give you some of it. Wow. That is not a generosity mindset. That is a, that is a, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to toss a little chump change at you to yeah. keep you on my side. Uh -huh. I mean, at the same time, let's just, Let's just rub the genie lamp at that point. Uh -huh. What do I have to do to keep you in my corner, God? Yeah. Okay. That's not the gospel. Yeah. Right. That's not a generous heart. Yeah. That is somebody who's just trying to appease God. A, God can't be appeased um, through our minuscule actions. But secondly, I would just simply say this those hopes, those dreams, those desires uh -huh. seem to be the hardest blank sheet of paper to hand over to God and say, right. I'll become whatever you want me to become. Uh -huh. and do whatever it is you want me to do and give whatever it is you want me to give. And I'll let you write my story. Yeah. That's a scary thing because at the end of the day, what it shows is I have trouble trusting. Like a lot of people go, I can trust God to forgive my past. Okay. Can you trust God to write your story in the future? That's right. And that's, that's scary. Yeah. I have to lean on him in faith and to go open-ended. I don't know. You may make me a dry cleaner. <laughs> like you see what yeah. I'm saying? And Jesus says this to his own disciple. He says, uh, uh, somehow he says uh, the essence of the idea of like, uh, little flock, it's my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's, it's his will to not only give us the kingdom, to see a movement. It's in his heart to see these things happen. Yeah. But then what's coming up in my, in my mind of all that is what you've been quoting a lot is, I think it's James 4, where he says, you have not because you ask not, and you ask and you don't receive because you're asking for your own good right. pleasure. You're asking because you're holding on to these things and trying mm -hmm. to achieve this calling, this vision, this whatever. That you've decided. And Selfish. He goes on that chapter and he highlights this idea that, uh, you know, you say you're going to go to this city, to that city, and you're going to make a profit, but you'll do that if it's God's will. Right. And there's this invitation really from the Lord to ask and believe that he's going to give us what we ask him, but to ask from the motive of, not us trying to fulfill our destiny, our calling, but just giving it over to the Lord. And um, since we are talking off the cuff a little bit, it, it might end up becoming a third podcast by accident. Um, but the, the wrestling between ambition and selfish ambition can, this is something that I've wrestled with a lot. Can I, as a follower of Jesus, have ambition? And, and I don't know if I have a perfect answer for that one yet, 
because when does ambition and selfish ambition begin to cross? Mm -hmm. And the truth is a matter is that most of the time my ambitions are pretty selfish. Yeah. Right. It's true. And that James five passage is what the Lord used back in 2000 and what, 16 or 17 to just totally destroy all the ways in which I was saying, God, I'm going to go to this town and that town, and I'm going to do this for you and that for you. And I'm going to make a plan and I have all these pieces. And, you know, I've told you uh, many times that I have a, a list of 53 cities that the Lord put on my heart in a super spiritual way through a buzz feed. Yeah. <laughs> Very spiritual. But I thought whenever the Lord put those on my heart, okay, how are all the ways that I can get to these 53 cities? Yeah. And that's why that season of repentance has pushed me to the place to where I'm going. We have to give our futures over to him because I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to quit telling you all the things I'm going to do for you. Because he says in James 5, that's evil. Yeah. To say, if the Lord wills, we will. But just to say, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this for you. Evil. It's not my plan. It's his plan. The irony is, is that I just said, okay, I'm not going to try to get to those. And we just went to work. And out of that, now we're in 13 of those 53 international cities. Yeah. And it's just by God's doing. It's not a strategic move. Now, when we recognize that it's coming, we're helping facilitate that. Yes. But, you know, like, how do you get somebody from Oklahoma City to Turkey? Well, there are so many things that are involved with that. The Lord's puts those kind of pieces together and then right. we respond to his work. Yeah. Right. So there's a humility in this conversation that says to become a contributor also has to mean that I have to repent and go, I'm not much in control. Mm -hmm. And that, yes, my contributions are eternal in value. Yeah. But they're not um, authoritative above Jesus. Yeah. They're just, they're literally just my part. It's just so much bigger than us, Mark. Yes. And that's where the, that's where that competition and, and contribution language, and you can read reading for rivals, but they compare yeah. that when there's a scarcity mindset, there's not enough to go around. We can right. eat. Right. When there's an abundance mindset, we contribute. And if there was ever a place for the church to not compete, it would be in the completion of the great commission billions of people there is an overabundance yeah of work left to be done there is no room for competition we have to contribute i think that great commission is a really good place to kind of bring that bring this together maybe as a landing point but you you mentioned the reading for rivals it's when they saw the big picture mm -hmm. that it's the great commission the work to be done but then you also combine that with what uh god spoke to abraham where can you hold that thought good pause Man, good stuff. Yeah. Repentance, 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 <laughs> repentance. Never going to change though, Mark. Yeah. That's all we do is like we live in obedience and repentance and hope something happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what that brings to my heart is a, a place that perhaps this could land uh, for this podcast and that's the great commission that you're bringing up there that uh god is casting a huge vision through jesus speaking this uh all nations uh being impacted all nations being brought in and being discipled as the task to be completed so drawing them into the big vision but then also connecting them with a god who has got all authority jesus he's got all the power to get this job done in the same way that he spoke to abraham uh that it, it was going to take God's power and God's sovereignty to get done the job that God assigned to Abraham. So it's those things together uh, that will really envision us individually and as the church to take our, to, to really repent into the right role to get the job done. And the biggest transition is going to have to become well, not what I can do, but what can we do? Yes. Um, Amen. We, and, and, and the we doesn't allow you to hide. I was in a mega church for a little while on staff pastoring. And one of the downsides of the we conversation is that you can hide and you can say I'm mission minded or missional or I'm a missionary because yeah, my church does it. Yeah. Right. Um, but there's also because of the abundance rather than scarcity, there's also no room for freeloaders. There's so much work to be done 
that we can't just have a handful contributing and then be like, we're going to get there. No, it's going to take every single believer doing their part. And I don't care if what you're doing at the time is you're discipling one to two, three people. Hmm. If we had 10 million believers all decide to start discipling three people, yeah, we multiply, yes, right? And then God will, in his sovereignty, expand the influence, and he will also expand the responsibilities yes. of certain individuals. I'll let you cut. No, 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 I'm going to say you do it. Okay. okay. After it's done, finish it up. I feel like we're weaving together all kinds of themes from the last year of these conversations. That's the way it works, I guess. That's the way it works. It'll work. So I just, I don't know, maybe even wrap up the ideas as even some encouragements of what the Lord's doing in my heart and what I'm wanting to see in other people. Um, and I'm not selfishly just using the term synergy over and over. It's just, it is the concept. It's just the word that I've put on, the, yep. the, the God who sent his son, who sends the Holy Spirit, who sends the church, and the church then sends um, one another, right? That theme that we see in the Bible is right. the sending of God and synergy, the coming together, the cooperative effort where together we achieve more than we can individually. Yes. And you put those two together, and we're saying that God is sending his church so that together we do exponentially more yes. than what we could do on our own individual efforts. Um, synergy. But we've got to remember even a theme that we've brought up many times. The master strategist is Jesus, and he is leading his church through the word of God and his Holy Spirit yeah. because he is the head of his church. And every single believer, every single church, every single network that comes together, every single tribe needs to figure out what is it that the Lord wants us to contribute and then give all the effort they have, leave it all on the field for their part in, in God's big story, right? So that each part of the wall in Nehemiah's conversation that we've had is being built. The whole wall can't be built unless each tribe is taking care of their section, but every single section requires every bit of effort that they have. They're sweating, they're working, they're laboring, but they're laboring together. And so We've got to get to a place to where we say, this is too big for me. It has to be a we. And the wig take question, what's it going to take, is not the question of what can I do, but what is it going to take for it to get done? And that always requires community. Mm -hmm. And it also requires communities in community with one another, right, um, to do that. And we're just a little bitty piece, but our piece matters, right? And so I can't be on the fence. I gotta get in the game, but I gotta get in the game with the community.